Opinions stated by various contributors to the Money and Business Show and related programs are not to be considered as endorsed by Radio Shalom, its employees. Visitors to this program are urged to use their own discernment to draw their own conclusions. Please read your prospectus and consult with your own investment advisor. Live from the studios of Radio Shalom, 1650 AM in Montreal, Canada, the city of Joie de Vivre, the world capital of culinary variety and the home of the Montreal Canadiens, this is the Money and Business Show with your host, Samuel Izerzer. Every week, Samuel and his guests discuss money, investments, financial services, and the world economy. Over the next hour, you can have your questions about business and personal finances answered. So call 514-738-4100, extension 200, to speak with Samuel and his guests. And now, here is the host of the Money and Business Show, Samuel Izerzer. Money, money, and business. Are CO2s or human use of fossil fuels, are they causing ultimately catastrophic global warming? Or is it because of natural climate cycles have already turned from warming to cooling on this earth? There has been studies that global temperatures have already been declining for more than 10 years, and global temperatures will continue to decline for another two decades, or even more. Decrease in global temperature is one of the most interesting conclusions to come out of the International Climate Change Conference sponsored by the Heartland Institute held a few years ago, the topic that was discussed, and as well as the economic implication of high cost of energy. Contrary to the self-interest political science you hear, from government finance global warming alarmist seeking to justify widely expanded regulatory and taxation powers of the government bodies such as the UN who wants all of us to believe that the world is warming up. So has the Heartland Institute effectively become the international headquarter of the climate <coughs> realist an analog of the UN's intergovernmental panel in climate change? which is called the IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change. The Heartland Institute, uh, where you can find climate realists, has come out of proof that in the 20th century, temperature record, you will find that it's up, n- not down. Pattern does not follow the Industrial Revolution upward march of the atmospheric carbon dioxide, which is CO2 which is supposed to be the central culprit for man-caused global warming. It follows instead the up and down pattern of naturally caused climate cycles. For example, temperatures dropped steadily from the late 1940s to the 1970s. I remember the mainstream media was even talking about a coming ice age. I remember that. Ice age have cyclically occurred roughly every 10,000 years with a new actual due around now. In in the year 2000, the UN's IPC Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change predicted that the government temperatures would rise 1 degree Celsius by the year 2014. Was that based on climate science or political science to scare the public into accepting costly anti-industrial regulations and taxes? The question should be, so it's politics, not science, driving climate change mania. My name is Samuel Izerzi, your host for the Money Mission Show on Radio Shalom Shijaras, 1650 AM in Montreal. Thank you for tuning in live with our business studios headquarters in Montreal, the financial capital, and the home of the greatest hockey team, the Montreal Canadiens. We have another great show for you today. And as always, you can uh, call if you have any questions, comments, or even criticism of today's show. Please call us directly at 514-738-4100, extension 200. Or you can email me at moneyandbusinessshow at gmail.com if you have any inquiries. You can also visit our website at www.radio-shalom.ca. All our shows are archived there. Our guest today is Lord Christopher Moncton, third Viscount Moncton of Branchley. But I want to introduce today... That's Viscount. A Viscount, thank you. <laughs> well done, Brian. You've got to thank you. <laughs> Viscount. Okay, I'll re-say that again later on. Um, how are you? How you doing, Brian? Oh, ready to argue with you I know guys. that. I, I'm, I'm, just, a, I'm, I'm a little bit, you know what? I'm a leash just ready I to know, go and say I'm you a, guys are ridiculous. I'm a little bit nervous. You should be. Because I see that be you're... Be afraid. I, be no, very afraid, I, I Sam. See, I see. It, it's not for you. It's not for our guests. <laughs> oh, no. It's not it's for, for Christopher. You. It's for you. Because <laughs> I see I see, I see, see a, uh, a line coming out, out of you already. And I, and I warned you. Please, you know. Just uh, your introduction has me full of notes. Yeah, I know that. I know that. And I, and I hope so. Because you know what? Let's get the truth out there. But anyways, today, 
I'm uh, introducing Lord Christopher Moncton, who uh, in 1979, Moncton meant Alfred Sherman, who co-founded the pro-conservative think tank and Center for Policy Studies. With Margaret Thatcher and Keith Joseph in 1974, Sherman asked Moncton to take the, the minutes uh, and the CPC study group meetings. Moncton also subsequently became the secretary of the Center's Economic Forward Strategy, Health and Employment Study Groups. He uh, wrote a paper on uh, privatization of council housing by means of rent to mortgage a scheme that brought him the attention of Downing Street. And now Lord Moncton joined the UK Independence Party uh, in, 19, uh, in 2009 and became its chief spokesperson on climate change. Since 2008, uh, he has uh, toured uh, Britain, uh, Ireland, uh, the US, China, Canada, India, Colombia, practically all over the world. Uh, talk about groups related to the subject of climate change. As the chief policy advisor for the U.S. lobby group Science and Public Policy Institute, he appeared at the Heartland Institute in 2008 International uh, Conference um, in, uh, on Climate Change. In 2009-2010, he was invited on four occasions before Congress to testify by Republican representatives on March 25, 2009. He appeared before the U.S. House Subcommittee on Energy and Environment, and in 2010, before the House Selected Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming. There's just more than that. How are you? How are you doing? It's very good to be with you, and uh, God bless Canada. God bless Canada, and God bless you. I see that uh, you're in Scotland right now. Uh, is that it? I'm in sunny Edinburgh. You know, the sun always yeah. shines in Scotland. We never get rain or anything. No rain? Or are you no being rain. sarcastic? <laughs> no, it's think, the most beautiful I think that day. was sarcastic. Fact, we've had a wonderful summer so far. <laughs> and you know that from December to March, the sun never rises either. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is true. We're quite close to the Ar Arctic Circle. But last week, I can assure you, it only rained twice. Once for three days and once for four days. <laughs> Thank you for that. I mean, you know, you always talk about the now, climate here. Now, that's a weather report, I believe. <laughs> but, Brian, <laughs> Brian, you know what? Let me ask the questions. That's how it goes, right? You have questions. Sometimes I might rebuttal. Let him talk because he's the guest, right? Oh, I'll let him okay? talk. Okay. You ask the question, but not a question of like a four or five minute long sometimes. You know, one of the long-winded. But anyways, you'll, you'll understand what I'm talking about, okay? Um. <laughs> What what is all about the you know the intergovernmental panel on climate change? Climate change statement uh, is it an orchestrated litany of lies? Well, to a very large extent, I'm afraid the answer is yes. Now, and I speak with some authority because I am an expert reviewer for the UN's climate panel, the IPCC, for its last uh, assessment report. They produce these huge multi-thousand page assessment reports on the climate every five years. They did them in 1990, 1995, 2001, 2007, and most recently last year. And these reports are supposed to summarize the state of the climate, and in particular, the human impact on the climate caused by our putting greenhouse gases, notably carbon dioxide, into the atmosphere. And uh, Moncton, uh, we'll be talking about is it politics, not science, driving climate change and mania. I'm with uh, Brian Wolofsky. Um, Lord Moncton, why are environmentalists and scientists so much less keen to discuss the long term increase in the southern he hemisphere? Uh, in fact, across the globe, there are about one million square kilometer more sea than 35 years ago, which is, you know, uh, the, the satellite. That's when the satellite started to measure. So we're talking about more ice out there. How come there, there's something missing here? Well, let's give you the, we're talking now about the extent of sea ice yes. around the Arctic and the Antarctic. Yes. Now, in the Arctic, over the last ooh, 35 years, since the satellites have been able to monitor for, it, 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 for us in real time, the sea ice extent has been declining quite sharply. On the other hand, at the other end of the Earth, in the Antarctic, and you won't hear this from Brian, and you won't hear this from the mainstream, I call them climate communist news media. <laughs> on, on, on the climate communist... All oh, right, I like this guy. I, li I like you. <laughs> but in the Antarctic, yes. there the ice has been, the sea ice has been growing to more or less the same extent that the sea ice in the Arctic has been declining. And in fact, just in the last month, we have had a record extent of Antarctic sea ice, more of it 
than has ever been seen before in the last 35 years since the satellites have been watching. So, therefore, what, do you, what the University of Illinois does is, is it combines the two records, the Arctic and the Antarctic, together. And that gives you the global sea ice record. And what that shows is no trend in the whole of the last 35 years. It simply hasn't gone anywhere. All that we've seen is something of a shift so that there's more sea ice in the Antarctic, you need a record amount down there, and less sea ice in the Arctic. And indeed, compared with, say, the 1920s, and you're both too young to remember that, but at that time, there was probably, we don't know for certain, we didn't have satellites, there was probably less sea ice in the Arctic then than there is now. The US Geological Survey did a report on it then, saying they'd never seen so little as there was. So sea ice in both the Arctic and the Antarctic are highly variable. They vary for, and are well known to vary, and this goes back hundreds of years since we've been sending ships up there. And these variabilities can be quite drastic, even from year to year, let alone from decade to decade. So, so far, there is no clear signal of global warming in either the Antarctic or the Arctic sea ice. Then there's the land ice. Now, most of the land ice in the world is in Greenland, where it's about 5% of it, and Antarctica, about 90% of it. Now, in Greenland, if you go back 8,000 years, and even Brian is too old to remember, uh, is too young to remember back this far, but 8,000 years ago, the temperature at the summit of the Greenland ice cap was actually 2.5 degrees Celsius higher than it is today. And yet, except at the coastal margins, most of the Greenland ice cap didn't melt this is because ice has enormous thermal inertia. And in order to make it do a phase transition from its solid to its liquid phase, which is water, you have to put in a lot of energy. And raising temperatures by two or three degrees Celsius, which is what the UN's climate panel tries to pretend we might do over the next century, is not going to be enough to melt any significant body of ice, except at the coastal margins, either in Greenland or in Antarctica. Now, in Antarctica, it hasn't got any warmer and may even have cooled down throughout the last 35 years. So there is no danger of the Antarctic ice disappearing anytime soon. So you can forget Al Gore's extravagant sea level rise because of melting ice. He said it was going to rise by 20 feet, which is, in your measure, about 7 meters, immediately because of global warming. Now, the judge in the high court case that we took against Al Gore's movie to stop the Department of Education showing it in UK schools unless corrections were made, said of Al Gore's comment about sea level that the Armageddon scenario that he depicts is not based on any scientific view. Brian, go ahead. I know you have a few questions. I'm sure uh, you've been writing quite a bit. I don't even know where to begin. Okay, so just begin somewhere. I see that. <laughs> I, 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 well, I, this, is why, this is why we have you. This is why we have you. I don't even know where to begin. Uh, for those this of you who haven't got color, at the moment, Brian is gasping like a stranded fish, <laughs> trying to think how to answer the welter of accurate information. The that welter of utterly the inaccurate, totally false, completely incorrect Information what? in quotation marks. All of a sudden, you became sharing. RBK, You became a scientist. <laughs> I studied science for years. I wanted to be an astrophysicist. Well, our guest uh, is also a scientist, too, right? I mean, you. you perhaps studied. you would like to differentiate the fundamental equation of radiative transfer for us on the air with respect to both temperature and radiative flux, and then tell us why it matters in the climate debate. You know, Just about, establish your about fifteen years ago. As a total aside, yeah. I met the man who came up with the Big Bang Theory, which he hated. He called it, he called it the Big Raisin Bread ba Bake. And he said to me, so why didn't you become an astrophysicist? And I said, Taylor series. And he laughed. He said, that, that's number one. The next two breaks are uh, Fourier transforms and tensor calculus. Those are the three things. If you can't do them... You can't be an astrophysicist. Okay. So you so couldn't I, manage Taylor series expansion? I couldn't expand. No, I couldn't. Right. They drove me bonkers. Well, you see, you do need to understand those in order to understand the climate, because this multiplication by three of the physical basis for how much warming you're going to get 
this one Celsius to three Celsius, this is what the UN's climate panel and all the models do, that is based on assuming that the temperature feedbacks are non-linear. And as you know, such non-linearities are simply uh, Taylor series expansions in disguise. All right, but Christopher, are you actually a scientist? Well, I'm a mathematician. So I, I, I studied classical architecture at Cambridge, which included a formidable amount of mathematics. I went on to study mathematics also at the Open University and uh, have done a great deal of mathematics over my life and have made a great deal of money out of it, which is more than most mathematicians can say. That's because true. I exploited a few years ago uh, an unsuspected wrinkle in the laws of probability that I discovered, which allowed me to make a 200-piece jigsaw puzzle that I reckoned nobody would be able to solve for 18 months. So I offered a million pounds of my own money to anybody who could solve it in 18 months. And eventually somebody did, and I had to pay out. But by that time, hey, it was 18 months later, I'd sold half a million of these at £30 a time. Do the math. <laughs> That's a lot that, of money. That math I can do. I didn't need what? integrals to do it. Um, <laughs> what's, in, what's in the background? Are you, um, uh, is there some construction going on? Just for our listeners, uh, there is a construction. Yes, there is. We've, we've got yeah. a big party, in fact, for alumni in Scotland of Churchill College, Cambridge, coming up in a couple of days' time here in my house. And so what we're doing is cleaning the windows and, and buffing up the carpets so that it's nice and tidy for them. <laughs> my right, lovely well, wife is quite messy, so we're clearing up after her. That's basically what's going uh, on. Good. All right, let's okay. start. I am not a mathematician. You have one question before the oh, uh, question. I, he has I've his got answer. pages. No, I know. I, I, listen, I got pages too. All right. That's why we're I'm, doing a two-part series. I'm not a series. mathematician, but I am, however, a hockey player in Montreal. And one thing we have in Montreal, or used to, is cold weather. And as someone who's been playing hockey outdoors since the 60s, I can tell you, I don't need anyone to tell me that it's gotten much, much, much warmer. Snow piles when I was a kid used to be easily 20 feet high and higher. Now they barely get that high. We have, we go down to minus so how 30. How was last winter for you? Not nearly very cold, cold enough. Very no cold. Way. I was very cold. <laughs> Sam, we used to have was that kind of year. temperature. My bills went up this we year. We used to I'm have that kind of temperature all the time in the 70s. Now it's irregular. It's yes, very, I was, winter, la, okay, but that's weather. I it's found this climate. year very cold this climate year. Brian, I was, long, I was freezing. Shh, climate Don't is, shoot me. Shh, climate is long-term Yep. environmental change weather is what happened last winter and as someone who's been playing hockey outdoors since the 60s i can tell you yep. it is much much warmer in montreal we All used right, to get just okay one second right one second let him let, let him stop you right yeah. there because you see that's the sort of typical argument yeah. you get from the climate communists. Now, come on, Brian, you need to raise your game on this, mate, because... Oh, I'm just getting from started. The time I look... <laughs> he called you a communist. I like that. I'm not insulted. ...a <laughs> small proportion of the total global surface. If you're talking of local warming, you could even be right. I don't know, because I haven't looked up the temperatures in Montreal. You may be right. But certainly, globally... There has been no global warming for the last 20 years. And if you go back to 1990, which is 25 years, which is when the UN first began making its predictions, there has been some global warming. But it's at a rate so that since 1990, we've had one third of a Celsius degree of global warming. Now, that's not enough for anyone to write home about. And it is half of what was predicted by the UN at the time. And it was on the exaggerated prediction that all this bedwetting on about how we've got to shut down the West for the sake of saving the communists, I mean, saving the planet. <laughs> That's where all this came from. <laughs> the fact is that it isn't happening anything like at the rate they said it would. It isn't going to happen at anything like the rate they say it's going to happen. They have already been forced almost to halve their near-term predictions of how much global warming there's going to be because they've been caught out so badly by their previous near-term predictions. Their models got it wrong. Get used to it, Brian. It's no good wittering on about you playing hockey in Montreal. The fact is, it's not getting warm at the rate they said it would. 
And so just get used to it. Okay, the fact that you're extremely entertaining, notwithstanding, and really, Terry Gilliam should have recruited you to be the seventh member of the troupe. Um, and for those who didn't catch the reference... I think I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> it that was a, a compliment. That was a compliment. Um, the the reference was to Monty Python, yeah. and I'm sure our guests do that very well. Um, your entertaining level, notwithstanding, and I'm not going to argue with you about simple facts that you have wrong, like the fact that 10 of the last 12 years on the planet have been progressively warmer than every other year since we started recording it 100-odd years ago. This is what I'm going to argue with. All right, and let me take you up on no, that No, 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 don't because take me up on it yet. I, I want to take you up on a much more important point. No, I'm not you taking you away with that one first. Let me deal with that. I know this gish gallop of garbage that okay. you communists of the climate like to come up I'm with. I'm a socialist, What I want not to do is stop you as each time you throw a piece of garbage out into the street, I'm going to make you clean it up. Okay. Now, here's the point. You, you're talking about each of the last 10 years having been among the 10 hottest years since records began. Records only began in 1850. If you were to go back to the... Medieval warm period, Lundquist et al. 2010, or go back to the Roman warm period, also covered by that paper, or go back to the Minoan warm period before that, or to the Egyptian Old Kingdom warm period before that, or to the Holocene climate optimum, called an optimum because it was warmer. Warmer is better than cooler. That's what life likes. It likes warmth and wet. doesn't like cold and dry up in the, up in the Arctic and the Antarctic. The fact is, it likes warmer weather, and the warmer weather that we have seen is nothing like as warm as most of the last 11,400 years. Most of the last 11,400 years have been warmer than the present. There's nothing unusual about today's temperatures. And if you take these last 10 years, the last decade was fractionally warmer than the previous decade. That was because in the first three years of the previous decade, there was the tail end of some quite rapid global warming caused by a known phenomenon known as the, as the warming phase of the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. It happens every 60 years. You get 30 years of warming followed by 30 years of cooling. We're now in the cooling phase. So the last 17 years, according to the RSS satellite data, show no global warming whatsoever. It is a zero trend. Go back 20 years and you do get a very small trend. But that is all. Lauren Monkton, we're going to be taking a commercial break, if that's all right. And then you can guys go scrimmage, you know, with my... Uh, co Did he call you... He, call he called you communist. I like that. And you called yourself socialist. I'm a socialist, I, I like not that. a communist. No, but he's right. He's 100% right. You are a socialist. And you know what? We're always wrong, and we don't know what we're talking about. This is... Thank you. I mean, I have someone who agrees with me for once. Good. Okay, my name is Samuel Izerza for the Money Mish Show on Radio Shalom, CJRS 1650 in Montreal. We'll be right back in two minutes. We're back, live in studio, with Samuel Azerzer in the business headquarters of Radio Shalom, 1650 AM in Montreal, with the Money and Business Show. You have questions about your personal finances? You need advice in making sound financial decisions? Samuel and his guests are ready to take your call at 514-738-4100, extension 200. And now, back to the Money and Business Show. We're, uh, we're back uh, with uh, Lord Christopher Moncton, and we're going to be talking, uh, is it politic, not science, driving climate change mania? We're going to be talking about the, the climate change, what's going on out there. Is it warming? Is it getting colder? Well, I'm in the camp that is getting colder. Obviously, uh, we have our communist friend over here who says that it's getting warmer. Now, I, I know you have a, about 4,000 questions, okay? But now, you know, we have a two-part show. That's why I have a two-part show for this, because you, you're going to have enough time. Usually, you know what, Lord Moncton, we don't really have an hour. Notice we, he keeps always, talking. He still doesn't. No, I know. It's a, usually, usually we have an hour, but this time I, I felt that Brian needed to talk a lot. This is this is who he is. So I hope you can put him in his place and tell him what's out there. I, I know you've spoken to many scientists and uh, and uh, and people out there that are, and also you've been speaking all around the world. So go ahead, Brian. Go okay. ahead. Ask him. Shoot. So, so you, you just responded to my last point, and I don't have, I'm not a climatologist. I don't have enough knowledge to refute it, but I'm going to say, I hear you, I just don't believe you, because there are a lot of people who 
must know what you were talking about. And well, can I just stop you right there? Very no, briefly I want to get to my that, point. To say that if the if the uh, readers and listeners and viewers, if your audience would like to check each of these facts, I'm going to tell you where I got them from. By all means, where I got the trend in global temperature was the Remote Sensing Systems, or RSS, Satellite Temperature Data Set. Now, you can download the actual numbers month by month for global temperature from that data set. And then, if you can work an Excel spreadsheet, it will calculate the linear trend for you. If not, I always write my own programs to calculate trends so I know what the program's doing. And I can assure you that for the last 17 years and 10 months, the trend on that particular monthly global temperature data set shows a zero trend, a completely flat line. 17 years and 10 months, you have to go back further than that before you can get even a flicker of global warming in that record. Can you, now, can if you, you were to take, say, the terrestrial record from the Hadley Center and the Climate Research Unit at the University of East Anglia, the Hadcroot 4 temperature data set, you can download that data as well, and you will find that for the last 18 years, there has been no global warming distinguishable from the combined measurement, coverage, and bias uncertainties that are published with that data set every month. You can check that for yourselves. You may need a mathematician or a statistician to help you with the numbers. If not, I can supply you with graphs showing these details. You simply email me via the show, and I can do the graphs for you. Can, uh, by the way, can, can you, can you repeat that? that. I, I just missed it because I was writing the something. The Remote Sensing Systems Satellite Data Set, yeah. and he also mentioned the Climate Research Center at the Hadley Center at the University of East Anglia. Okay, before you... Did I get that right? Yeah. More or less, yes. it's <laughs> called Hadcrut 4, that last one, H-A-D-C-R-U-T 4. Mm-hmm. And you can just put that into your search engine, you'll be able to track down the data, you can plot it for yourself, or get us to do it for you. That's Hadcrut 4, H-A-D-C-R-U-T 4. Now, you see, what you're getting here from me is no bullshit. You asked, Sam, quite yes. rightly, you asked for the facts. Exactly. I'm not only going to give you the facts, I'm going to tell you, you where I got them from and how you can check them. Because that way, you will know I'm not giving you some political anti-communist bullshit. I'm giving you the true facts. Good. Yeah, Brian is, is grinning from here to here. Yes, only he because I like you and I disagree with program, everything you're saying, up. but I like you. He <laughs> likes he likes you, but he disagrees. By the way, you do have a foundation. This is how I actually found you. Um, yes. can, can you just give you, know, you? You can plug in right I now. I still plug. haven't had my question. No, I know that. I know okay. that. I know. For once, somebody's interrupting you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know that I can't even, I can't, I can't do what you do. I don't know how you do it, but maybe you'll tell me one day, by the way, um, how do we find you and get information about you? Well, there are various places you can go. The first is lordmonctonfoundation.com. This was set up by friends of mine in Australia. I was rather flattered. They wanted to put it in my name, but they did. So there's, there's some material there, or you can go to wnd.com. That's world net daily wnd.com. I have a weekly column there, which is famous for its sharp and entertaining wit. You can also, and and modesty as well, and you can also go to scienceandpublicpolicy.org, where you will find something like a hundred papers by me, written for the layman, which is just as well because I am one, uh, to explain various aspects of climate science and mathematics. Good. Go ahead, Brian. Uh, Okay, here's here's the real issue. You mentioned that, I mean... From your perspective, everybody like me who just utterly and completely believes the vast number of climatologists who say this is real, you say that... When you say a vast number, how many? And how do you know? The vast majority. Let's put it that way. Because everybody who has ever said, oh, no, it's nonsense. Not everybody, but a good deal of them say... Well, the reason I said it was nonsense was because I was being paid by a foundation run by Exxon or the Koch brothers, who are all in in the industry. Oh, so here process. we get the usual climate communist line that those who oppose them are being paid. Do you suppose that those who are peddling the communist line are not being paid? I, for one, am not being paid by anyone. Not I think those who are. Here. I think it's those shocking. who are peddling the lo- peddling, who look at the actual data and come up with the conclusions that and I, are you that I believe paid? because these conclusions they've been coming up with since 
to my knowledge, at least the 70s, they're government employees who get paid very little. And in the case of Canada, they end up getting fired by the progressive government, the progressive, the conservative government of Stephen Harper, which is absolutely religiously antithetical to anything resembling, I'll use the term in quotes, truth that they don't agree with. So they fired all the environmental you scientists in Canada and, and wandering they have away, wandering away. No, I'm truth. not wandering fact, away. I'm stating the reality. When no, came to shove, I'm still unable to name how many scientists because it's irrelevant. Say what you say. Christopher, the what's, is, there's a tiny handful of climate communist scientists saying this is about two dozen of them and that's it. No, that's absolutely majority, untrue. I'm going to give you the figures now, and I'm going to tell you where I got them from. And then I will the take them case, and get them to David admit, Suzuki, who will refute them. Could you, this is could Lee you let Gate him? et yeah. al. Lee Gate et al. 2013. L e g a t e s. Now, David Lee Gate is a former state climatologist of. Um, you were talking about state climatologist. He's a state climatologist of the state of Delaware. He's a professor of geography at the University of Delaware. And he and Dr. Willie Soon of the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics and Dr. Matt Briggs, a statistician, and I co-authored a paper in which we examined the results of a survey conducted by researchers in Queensland where they had reviewed the abstracts or summaries of 11,944 papers on climate and related matters published over the 21 years, 1991 to 2001. And of those 11,944 papers, would you like to know how many, Brian, actually said that most of the global warming since 1950, the global warming you're complaining about, has, was caused by us? I'll tell you how many papers it was. 64. And that's 0.5%. So that is what the scientific consensus about how, about how much global warming we have caused actually is, 0.5%. Now, if you way, ask wait, a wider wait, wait, wait. question, if you say, is it possible for man to have some influence on the climate? Do we have or may we have some influence? Then I, for one, would answer yes to that. Indeed, at a recent Heartland conference, the Heartland Institute's conference on climate change in Las Vegas, just 10 days before we recorded this interview, in that conference, I took a vote among the 650 delegates there. These were climate skeptics. I said, how many of you deny that man has some influence on the climate and may have caused some warming since 1950? Not a single hand was raised. There is a 100% consensus among climate skeptics that we can have some influence on the climate. But in the scientific literature, the consensus to the effect that most of the global warming since 1950 was caused by us is 0.5%. By the way, to those listening who don't know British expressions, when he says not 0.5%, he's not saying it isn't. What he's saying is not is another word for zero. It's zero so he's saying 0.5%. Yes. Okay, but here's my point. Let's say you're right, Okay. If we start creating... I am right. I'm always right. I, yes, <laughs> I'm sure you are, but let's suppose I, I right. still disagree with no, you. No, I, I think he's 100% I'm right. I'm sure you do, Sam. Yes, I did. Um, let's say you're right. Hmm. What is there to lose by developing a renewable inter energy industry globally? Let's say you're, if you're wrong, we can only get the temperature lower that, and, that's and the in, no let me finish but it is an important you studied logic me, you know you i'm right, right. Okay. Okay. if you're right if, if wait, 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 let me thought, finish if i'm if right there there's money, no law in no no hang on if i thought there was money in building stupid windmills which is 13th century technology to fail to address a 21st century non-problem then i would not put my money into it unless there was bags and bags of government subsidy because it isn't going to pay. The reason why it isn't going to pay is a phenomenon known as the BETS limit, B-E-T-Z. That tells you what is the maximum amount of power you can get out of a given um, turbo flow of a fluid such as air or water. 
And so this bets limit applies to tidal power, it applies to wind power, and it imposes a limit, an absolute upper limit, on how much power you can get, even if the wind is blowing at an optimal speed. And therefore, the problem with these so-called renewable technologies is that they are prodigiously expensive. They do not pay their way. They're way, way, way more expensive than fossil fuels. They're even more expensive than nuclear energy. And that's saying quite a lot. So the reason why you wouldn't just throw other people's money at subsidizing rich people to get even richer, rich landowners in Scotland to wreck the landscape and kill off the birds and bats with these windmills, is that it's cripplingly expensive. And what we've now had in the very cold winter we had two years ago here in the UK, we had an excess death of 31,000. Now, normally it's about 25,000 excess deaths in the winter because of cold weather. It was 31,000 that year, not because the winter was cold, but because people's homes were cold, because they could no longer afford to pay the cost of electricity and a large proportion of the doubling of electricity costs in the UK over the last five years is because the governing class is throwing money at these renewable industries and therefore putting up electricity prices to pay for it. And people can't afford any longer to heat their homes. In Scotland, 27% of households are in what is officially defined as fuel poverty but they can't afford to heat their homes. So they die in the winter because it's too cold. I visited an 85-year-old lady the other day, and she, it was in that really cold winter, and throughout that winter, she could not afford to turn her heating on because the government had stupidly increased the prices to pay for this so-called renewable energy. If renewable energy were worth doing, the private sector would do it. You don't need government subsidy. If you use government subsidy and you put up electricity prices to do it, you end up killing people in large numbers. And that, to me, is not a good idea. Uh, I, I'm sorry to hear about the way they're doing it over there, but it, the, the statement, if renewable energy were worth doing, then private energy would do it, I fundamentally disagree with that statement because you need to have government funds developing Why? these things to get Why? to the point where they're because you use government funds on all kinds well, of basic we, research yeah, well, we do. for, we for, for, well, we did, for we a century or more. We built our railways, for instance. We built them anyway. We built them on private funding. And the, if some you bought yes, shares of the no. Great Western Railway when it was first built, you knew you weren't going to get an early dividend back. In fact, they didn't pay a dividend for 26 years. Most of the, shareholders, the initial shareholders were dead by the time that, that started paying out. When it did pay out, it paid out very handsomely. But the private sector, if it were allowed to keep enough money to do these things, would do it at half the cost of the public sector. And it was Milton Friedman uh, in Chicago, just across the lake from you, who first you got his Nobel Prize for economics for calculating that if you want any given thing done in the industrial sector, the private sector will do it at half the price and employ twice as many people to do it. Yeah, no, I, I, I passionately disagree with that statement. But let's go to this. Well, I, you disagree with Wynn. Oh, I this. know that. I just think that Friedman was wrong. But what about, I, I, follow, I follow Joseph Stieglitz and Paul Krugman, who would disagree with it and give you the numbers better than I. But sure, let me ask you about this. A very prominent one. Thank yes. you. I appreciate the, being lumped in the same category as them. That was a compliment uh, akin to your Monty Python one. So do you have the same problems with solar wave and geothermal energy you do with wind yes solar solar energy is has a rather fundamental problem which is uh, applies also to wind and that is that it is incapable of delivering what is known as base load power we are for instance doing an interview here which is going to be taped for approximately two hours and uh, if you were relying on wind energy and the wind dropped or if it were suddenly to become night where this was happening and the sun wasn't shining, you don't get any power out of those systems. No, that's why you so have batteries the, to storage so capacitors. The, the intermittency of wind and solar power is the big problem. You have to have backup then in the shape of nuclear power or coal-fired power, coal-fired power being far and away the cheapest, and these days almost the cleanest, actually, because they with um, fluidized bed uh, combustion, and by supercritical uh, combustion also, and by flue gas trapping, 
and all these measures. It's now actually very clean to live next door to a coal-fired power station. It wasn't in the old days, but it is now. So there's no longer any reason why we shouldn't use coal-fired power, gas-fired power, to produce our electricity or nuclear power. That's what gives you the base load, and it gives it to you at a price which is a tiny fraction of the price of solar power and wind power. Now, I do think, and indeed recently advised the Qatari government on this very point, that if you have a lot of sunshine and a lot of sand with nothing else much going on in it, and you put solar panels there, it's not going to cause any environmental damage to the plants and creatures underneath, because there aren't any. And you've got lots of sunshine, and there, at least during the day, you can generate electricity very economically. But not everywhere does that work. So you have to, it's horses for courses. In places like Canada, solar power isn't going to be all that useful because you're too far north. It's the same in the UK. Wind power is very good up to a point in Scotland. The problem is that even in Scotland, where we have plenty of wind, it still isn't economic to have wind power. And the environmental damage it does is enormous. First of all, there's the environmental damage in extracting from the neodymium ore the actual neodymium from which the the stators in the motors of these windmills are made. And there's two tons of, of neodymium alloy in each uh, of these devices. And thousands of square miles of Western China have been destroyed by the acid leaching process to get the neodymium out from the ore. So a huge environmental footprint. So if you feel good about putting up your windmill, think again. The damage it's doing environmentally in China is enormous. Then. There are the birds and bats on our estate. We used to have a breeding pair of ospreys. The last year we saw them was three years ago. And then now we're surrounded. We won't have them on our estate, but we're surrounded by these ridiculous windmills. And we suspect that they've been killed by those windmills. The populations of the rare raptors throughout Scotland and the populations of rare bats are being decimated and decimated again by these hideous bird blending machines. So there are huge environmental prices to pay if you have costly and inefficient wind power. And that's why I'm against it. Okay, we'll talk you, about you know, the geothermal after the break, right but after, we need to go to break. Okay, yeah, we need, definitely we need... Yeah, thank you very much, Brian. Again, uh, we're with uh, Lord Moncton. We're going to be talking about the climate change. Uh, is it warming, not warming? Uh, some of us think so, some of us not. I believe I'm in the camp that uh, the world is actually getting uh, colder. Anyways, my name is Samuel Izerza for the Money and Business Show on Radio Shalom, CJRS 1650 AM in Montreal. Happy capitalism and God bless you all. Shalom AM, Money and Business. Sam and Zerza, let's get them. <laughs> oh. It won't be long before that money hits you. You reach a certain point where that money is an issue. Yeah. Tax cut inflations, learn about investments. Shoot another perfect show that can help them. Shalom, am I'll be tuning in live. Right. Sam and Zerza, got the advice for you and I. Kick your feet up, listen to the speaker. Got questions, no sweat, take that number. It's real easy, it's 514 738 4100. Get connected, hit that extension it's 200 money in business that's what i'm talking about money 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 your business opinions stated by various contributors to the money in business show and related programs are not to be considered as endorsed by radio shalom its employees visitors to this program are urged to use their own discernment to draw their own conclusions please read your prospectus and consult with your own investment advisor